All right, uh, we're going to talk about rules uh, 10 and 11 today. Um, going over a couple of different things about uh, preparing for and making a stroke, uh, which is also not combined with advice and the caddies rule within rule 10. And then 11, we're going to talk about a ball in motion accidentally hits something. Uh, and the, the, that rule is divided up into three different parts that we will talk about the different things that we have to deal with depending on what the ball in motion hits. So. All right, so we'll start off rule 10 today, preparing for and making a stroke with advice and help in the caddies. These are the three parts that we're going to talk about uh, in depth today. And here's our purpose statement. It covers how to prepare for and make a stroke, including advice and help the player may get from others, including your caddy and your partner. The underlying principle is that the golf is a game of skill and personal challenge. So this is the rule that talks about that caddies and partners not being able to line you up anymore. They want, uh, this is a game of skill and challenge, and they want the player to be able to do this on their own. All right, some notable changes um, moving forward with this rule is making a stroke when standing across the line of play is not allowed anywhere on the course. So what this is talking about is uh, the croquet style stroke. Before it was not allowed on the putting green, and now it's not allowed anywhere on the golf course. So if you were to putt the ball from the fringe, uh, you were able to do it this way with the croquet style standing astride is what they used to call it, that is no longer allowed. So no more shots between your legs. Can't do that anymore. Um, but yeah, so this is now going to be covered everywhere on the golf course, not just the putting green like it was in the previous rules. Quick yep. Can you do it backwards? You can do it backwards as long as you're not standing on your line. Okay. Between the, between the legs is going to be standing across your line. It's going to be a violation. So yeah, because you're still your line of play. Still your line of play. Yeah, so anytime you're going to hit the ball, do not stand on your line of play, unless it's an accident, which we've talked about, if you're accidentally doing it or trying to get out of somebody's way, but we'll get into that a little bit more specifically later. Line of play in the putting green may be touched, for instance, in showing a player where to aim, even when the ball's in the putting green. So if your partner or your caddy was touching the green with his hand or his foot or his flag stick or his club before it was a penalty to show you where to aim, now it is no longer a penalty. Player's caddy or partner must not be positioned behind the player when the player begins to take his or her stance. And this is one of the bigger changes of this rule, not allowing the alignment to go on when a player is getting into their stance. All right, so the purpose uh, statement now is kind of even divided up into uh, the specific parts of this rule. Uh, must mean something important, so let's see what it talks about. So rule 10.1 covers how to make a stroke in several acts that are prohibited in doing so. A stroke is made by fairly striking the ball with the head of the club. Does it say the front of the club? No, it says the head of the club. So if you hit it forward or backwards with the head of the club, you're going to be OK there. Okay, the fundamental challenge is to direct and control the movement of the entire club by freely swinging the club without anchoring it. And here's where the anchor rule comes in. It used to be in rule 14. Now they've combined it in here into rule 10. Okay. So 10.1a says, the player must fairly strike the ball with the head of the club such that there is only momentary contact between the club and the ball. And you must not push, scrape, or spoon it. Uh, spoon was an old word that they used in the rules. I just kind of threw it in there just because I'm familiar with it. Um, and if the player's club accidentally hits the ball more than once, there has only been one stroke and there's no penalty. What's that rule? TC Chin or the double hit rule. Uh, there are a couple of videos going out here. I've had a couple people send to me over the weekend. Um, people are already starting to giggle. They know what's going on here. Uh, so let's go ahead and address it. And hopefully anybody who's seen these videos of the players hitting the shot and popping it up and then continuing on and hitting it again, Hopefully nobody in this room thinks that that's only one stroke. Please. If, if, if you do, we need to talk, and let's talk about your assignments later moving on forward. <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, no, uh, the, the, you've seen videos of a player that will pop it up and then continue the swing and kind of hit it maybe around a tree or in a different direction. So let's uh, break that down. How many strokes is that going to be? Total of four. We're going to take one stroke, the original stroke, hitting the ball. The ball's in the air. They have intent to hit it again, right? There's your second stroke, plus they played a moving ball, which is a two-stroke penalty. So while people think that they're getting around the rules with a one-stroke TC chin deal, they're actually costing them four strokes in that situation. So please don't share that with anybody and say, keep working on this, unless you really want to take a lot of money from them. So that's, that's up to you guys. So, But it, how many people have seen that video? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Again, what's the point of the, of the rule? What is the point? There's one big word in there. Accidental. Accidental. If you accidentally hit the ball twice, there is no penalty. Or three times, or four times. Uh, but it's got to be one stroke. 
Okay, you can't. In fact, one of the videos I saw, the guy was you know, talking about what was he was going to do. So there was clearly some intent of what he was going to do. And so, again, focus on the accident point of that. All right, so now we're talking about anchoring here. Uh, this rule, it's obviously just put into play in 2016, uh, still going forward uh, with the new rules, but uh, nothing has changed with the definition of anchoring or an anchor point, but we'll go over it again here. So directly by holding the club or grip weight, a gripping hand against any part of the body is an anchor. So when we've got that, that club right there up in that guy's chest, that is an anchor. That is not allowed. Okay? Or we've got the hand up against the body, and it's, it's really strong up against the body. So if we have incidental contact with your clothing or your body, it is not a violation of anchoring. Okay? It has to be intentionally holding your hand against the body or the club against your body. Okay. And this is one of those rules a lot of people have talked about for, for a few years now. We're not, you know, peering in on players and seeing if they're doing it. You know, we just, we know what the rule is, and if there is a violation, we're going to talk to the player about it. We're going we're to see what's going on. It's not your responsibility as a rules official to try to see if he's actually anchoring it. Um, but if you do see something where you think there is something going on, then that's when we address it. Okay. Okay, the anchor point. Okay, so indirectly is what they're saying with the new rules through the use of an anchor point, by holding a forearm against any part of the body to use a gripping hand as a stable point around which the other hand may swing. So we've got the forearm attached to the body at that point, keeping that top hand stable and the lower hand free underneath it. This is an anchor point, and this is not allowed in the rules. You're still you're creating an anchor point with your forearm. Everybody understand those two there? Any questions on that? All right. So again, like I mentioned earlier, if the player's club, gripping hand, or forearm merely touches his or her body or clothing during the stroke without being held against the body, there is no breach of this rule. Okay? Again, an accident, you know, Bernard Longer's probably been asked about this a lot of times. He's one of the guys that's really been talking about it. He's got it really close there, and I'm sure he brushes up against his, his jacket or his shirt. That's not a violation. He doesn't have it purposely held in position up against his body. And for, yep. Mm -hmm. your arm. Yep, and, and holding your arm. So the question is, is holding your forearm of, uh, anchoring or a violation of this rule? And the answer is no. It specifically says in the rule that you can, you can grab your arm or you can put your club up against the forearm. And that, that, that's not a violation. <coughs> so for purposes of this rule, the forearm means any part of the arm below the elbow joint and includes the wrist. So anything that is going to be in here is going to be considered the forearm, and that's pointed out because of what Liz just asked. Why, when can we put something against it? What can we grab? So the forearm is okay. Okay. Here we go. We're talking about the between the leg shot. The player must not make a stroke from a stance with a foot deliberately. There's an important word again. Deliberately. Placed on each side of with either foot deliberately touching the line of play or an extension of that line behind the ball. And for this rule only, the line of play does not include a reasonable distance on every, either side. So when we talk about the line of play, we've got you know, where our ball is and the direction we want it to go, but the line of play does include a reasonable amount on each side specifically says in this rule it doesn't, doesn't include that reasonable amount on each side. So it's really a small line there. Okay, so they're trying to help out the player here. So. And there is an exception here. There's no penalty if the stance is taken accidentally or to avoid another player's line of play. Okay, so this is not an accident. This player's hitting the shot between the legs. He's going to be getting a penalty here. I would like to see the result there. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a brave boy so as far as I know. Okay, and again, I'm pointing this out. This is not just on the putting green anymore. It is everywhere. All five areas of the golf course. We cannot do this. Yeah, he's got his foot in the air, and he's just hitting the shot between his legs. Everybody can do it, right? <laughs> it took me a while to, to find this, this image, but uh, I did find one, so. All right. Let's talk about playing a moving ball. The little example that we had with the video. Uh, that I talked about a few minutes ago does have a, a violation of playing a moving ball. And so let's talk about the, the violation here. So a player must not make a stroke at a moving ball, and a ball in play is moving when it's not at rest at a spot. Thank you. That's pretty straightforward. A ball that comes to rest is wobbling, sometimes referred to as oscillating, the old rule uh, term that we used, but stays on or returns to its original spot. It is treated as being at rest and not a moving ball. So a ball just kind of wiggling like this, if it's not changing its position, is at rest. 
according to the rules of golf. Okay, here we go. Let's see if I can get this video going here real quick. Everybody remembers this video. All right. <coughs> well, thanks for some uh, video evidence of a rules violation from Mr. Daly. Appreciate that. All right, so why is this playing a moving ball? I mean, let's, let's just break this down as simply as we can. He had some intent to go hit the ball, right? Okay. So can't do that. This is, I think, if I'm not mistaken, this was like the third time he tried to put it up that hill. I mean, it, it took away. So he was, he was already at his boiling point. But anyway... <laughs> He, he didn't try to stop the ball, he didn't do it accidentally, he purposely made a stroke, so the stroke is going to count, he's going to get two more on top of it, and he's going to play it as it, where it came, after it came to rest, so, all right. There are three exceptions to this, okay, and th we'll get into this one, I know you were bringing up here in a second, Romano, but we'll, these exceptions will cover that. Exception one, the ball begins to move only after the player begins the backswing for a stroke. So we talked about this last week, the player starts to make a stroke and the ball starts to move and you hit it, there's no violation. Okay, for hitting a, a moving ball. Now, if the player caused that ball to move, we're going to deal with that in a different rule. So if the player may have like that forward press and caused it to move, and then we'll deal with it on, underneath a different rule. Okay. The second exception is a ball falling off a tee. Making a stroke at a ball falling off a tee is covered by Rule 6.2b5, not this rule. So there's no penalty for playing a ball that's moving off of a, or falling off of a moving, excuse me, moving off of a tee, falling off of the tee in the teeing area. Okay. And the third exception is a ball moving in water. When a ball is moving in temporary water, also, that's a new addition there. So not just water in a water hazard as it used to be. Now it's water in a penalty area or temporary water. So if the ball is moving in water, you get to play it. How about that? Okay. The player may make a stroke at the moving ball without penalty, or you may take relief. You can grab it while it's moving. So there's no penalty for stopping your ball in motion for that situation, whether you're taking for casual water or a penalty area, 16.1 or 17. In either case, the player must not unreasonably delay play. Again, we can't just see where the ball's going to end up and maybe play it later down the road type of thing. So, okay. And if you uh, breach rule 10.1, you're going to get the general penalty. So stroke play, you're going to add two to your score. The stroke's going to count. Um, and then in match play, you're just going to lose the hole. Okay. Any questions on 10.1? I think you, were talk you wanted to talk about an oscillating ball real quick. <laughs> Mm -hmm. comes back to the original position. Mm -hmm. then, yeah, if a ball moves and comes back to its original position, has it moved in the rules of golf? No. No. A ball is moved if it comes to rest in another location. So the, the English definition of move doesn't apply. What we know is a ball actually moving. But in the rules of golf, it has to move and come to rest in a different position. So the question I have is, do I use the word Oscillating or... Or, or wobbling, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and why would we use a new different term is, and if you notice the, the general feel of the new rules is there's a lot of examples in the new rules. And this is just another example, and I think it's a great idea to put it in there. So, but it, it doesn't change any definition or anything like that. Pushing a putt, explain yeah, that to me. Like, he, he, his ball's up against the putt, it's, it's, he's touching the ball, like when he's addressing his putt? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And does the ball, and does the ball move? The ball moves and it's going towards the hole, but he's pushing it. Okay. So, like, he, he addresses the ball and it moves, and then he, as it's moving, he makes a stroke. Okay, so if he causes the ball to move, he's going to be subject to a one-stroke penalty. But in this special instance, he's not going to be required to replace it, and we're going to play the ball as it lies. And that's, that is covered in Rule 9, I do believe. But yeah, that's, that's how we'd handle that. So, like when you look at some of them, uh, where the ball's moving and you can stroke at it, mm -hmm. that's one thing. What if he had just walked up and just... Okay, so, so the, the Phil Mickelson question. I knew this was going to come up today. and Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, but uh, what was different about the Mickelson situation? And according to the decision that they made, nothing. Okay? Um, but so he, Mickelson walked over, actually kind of half 
jogged over there and made a stroke at a moving ball, and he got the two-stroke penalty for that. Um, I'm in the camp personally, and, and with this being on video, I'm sure this won't get to Phil, I hope, but I'm in the camp that he should have been DQ'd. Um, but that wasn't my decision to be made. So like, if, for example, Phil went over and just stopped the ball. Okay, this rule would not be applicable because he's not playing a moving ball, he's stopping a ball in motion, which is covered a little bit later today in Rule 11. So, so there would be a different situation, um, but a different penalty, but maybe the same strength of penalty. So, all right. I'm sorry? What did they do with John Daly? John Daly was penalized two strokes for the, for the playing the moving ball. He only played a moving ball one time. John Daly played a moving ball one time. He tried three times to get it up the hill. The third time he said, screw it, I'm done, boom. And he played a moving ball. So he, that's what he got. Right. Yes, if, in that case, yes. If, and the question is, if you push the putt, is that the general penalty? Yes. From what I understood uh, Ray's question to be was the player addressed the ball, pushed it, and the ball moved, and he hit it as it was moving. So slightly different situation. But yeah, if you just put your putter down and push the ball, that would be a general penalty. You're, you're correct. All right, good questions. All right, let's talk about advice and other help. So there's a, a little purpose statement for 10.2 as well. A fundamental challenge for the player is to deciding the strategy and tactics for his or her play. So there are limits to the advice and other help the player may get during a round. So there is some things that you can't even get from your caddy and things like that. It's very limited. Uh, but the caddy and the partner and the player are all one unit, and they can work together with some small limitations that we will talk about here shortly. So, All right, so let's talk about what advice is and what we can and cannot do. During a round, and I just left this statement up here first, why? Why do you think this, I left this up here on purpose? During a round, it's very important to know. So not, be, not before the round, not during a stoppage of play. This is during the round, so the advice falls under during the round. A player must not give advice to anyone in the competition who is playing on the course. Now, be careful in reading this, this specific sentence. This is very important. Give advice to anyone in the competition who is playing on the course. Those are important things to notice. There's three real important things that I've pointed out there that we need to know. Right? Ask anyone for advice other than the player's caddy. So ask is an important word there. Anyone is an important word there. Okay? Calling up your mom and asking her. Not going to be allowed. You can't ask her unless she's your caddy. Okay. Cannot touch another player's equipment to learn information that would be advice if given by or asked by the other player, such as touching the other player's clubs or bag to see what uh, clubs are being used. There was a decision that everybody's familiar with, hopefully, that, of moving a towel to see what club Somebody played, a violation then and a violation now, okay? So if also if uh, Jackie and I are playing a, a, a match and we're at a par three and she's choosing between a seven and an eight iron and she throws down the eight iron and goes and hits the seven iron, if I go over and pick up the eight iron and look at it to see what it is, I'm in violation. This specific statement right here covers that. Okay? <laughs> then we might start talking about the player's intent and things like that, so, yeah. But... If, if, you show, if somebody shows a club, is that advice? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is. It's the same thing as saying eight iron. Eight iron. You know, I've always used the joke when Doug and I are playing, Doug will be sitting there thinking what he's going to hit, and I'll say, hey, Doug, I got up at 6 o'clock this morning. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yep. I think you could. I think you could. Well, look at it. I want to look at that one. Because it, it, it would... The new, the new rules are a little bit more about player integrity. I think we're probably going to end up at the conclusion that, that you're talking about there, but I want to look at it. Yeah, I just, I just want to double check that. Yeah, I just want to double check that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, how, that's how the rules should be, just one sentence. Just don't cheat. So, Mark. Right. 
So, so here's the, the thing. In an AJG event, uh, we, I, I'm familiar with this situation too as well, Mark. Um, a player went to the restroom, and while she was going to the restroom, her mother, a spectator, told her to relax, just kind of calm down. Um, and this, was, this didn't happen in these current rules, but however, that was an AJGA violation for their terms of the competition. It's not a rule of golf. So if, if your mom is sitting there and you go to the bathroom and she says something to you, and this is why I also highlighted give and ask here, okay? Nowhere in this rule does it say receiving advice is a penalty, okay? Keep that in mind. I know we've had some good discussions about that, but just receiving advice is not a penalty. So, like, again, my example is Tiger Woods. Somebody's got in the, in the crowd says, Tiger, hit a seven iron. Okay, two strokes to Tiger. No, <laughs> doesn't make sense, right? Right, so, so that's a very good point, but that is an AJGA specific term of their competition. Mm -hmm. they didn't request that. But the player showing the club will be penalized. The yeah. So if somebody, so if Bob shows me his, if Bob shows me his seven iron, and you know, for for the purpose of telling me what club he hit, Bob gets the penalty. I don't. But I didn't. I didn't solicit the advice. But his teammate that received it, it should not have gotten the penalty because of that. Right. But again, it's an AJGA the thing that we we're talking about there, I'm but specific. Of high score state, 2018 here. Right. Right. That was a, a, a different situation, a right? For both. Yes. And they have, what you're saying, what, they but have given you're you're confusing yourself in the situation. There was more to it. The player did ask for advice that got penalized. Okay. Yeah. So, but if he if someone just shows you the club, I was not there right? Season, yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> I I believe you called me that day. That was that was a fun day. Um, but anyway, so if a player again to clear this up, if a player shows a club, that is giving advice. The person receiving it is not going to be penalized. However that player does need to take some action to tell him to stop it. So if it keeps on going over and over again, now the player is going to be subject to penalty. Okay, Sean. Would yardage be advice? And the question is no. No. Uh -huh. Right. Now that's, a, that's probably going to be a, a very a good example of advice in that situation because what, cl what did it play to? Okay. So the question was, you know, is 135 yards advice? No. Did that play 135 yards? That is advice because now you're getting some information on how to play the next stroke and a way to play the next stroke, not just a distance. Understand that, that difference? That's a very good question. Thank you. Okay, one more question, we're going to move on. Okay, so I'm just thinking of an instance of that that would happen on a par three where there's a plate in the ground that has yardage, uh -huh. and then one of the other players walks in and says, that's incorrect. Okay. It, that would not be a bind. So, so if a player goes over and sees a yardage on a par three, let's say it says 135, that seems to be my number for the morning, and says that's not correct, okay, do we have an advice situation? No. No, a, a player's opinion on a yardage is not going to be considered advice. If he says, well, I'm going to play it at 110, now he might be giving advice. Okay. All, right. All right, again, this, uh, this last sentence here that we popped up here, it does not apply before round while play is stopped under 5.7 or between rounds in a competition. So again, it's during the round that advice is uh, going to be a violation. All right, so pointing on the line of play for a ball anywhere except the putting, can, I need, need to move on just a little bit. I'll, I'll talk with you here in just a second. I'll get you. Okay, so pointing out a line of play for a ball anywhere except on the putting green. A player may have his or her line of play pointed out. And notice that we, we mentioned this a long time ago, but line of putt is no longer a term in the rules of golf. It's, all, it's a line of play on the putting green or line of play in the general area, so on and so forth. So, so having his or her caddy or any other person stand on or close to the player's line of play to show where it is, but that person must move away before the stroke is made. This is not a change. This is exactly the way the rule has always been. So if you want to stand on a line to show somebody where to play, you're fine. You just have to move when the stroke is made. Okay. Having an object, such as a bag or towel, set down on the course to show the line of play, but the object must be removed. So you can throw a towel down. Okay. But again, if something is there that's uh, been sitting there in the fairway, you can leave it there and utilize it. So if you come up over a hill and there's a towel sitting in the fairway and it happens to be where you want to aim, that's fine. This rule specifically says having an object set. 
So if you actually have somebody go put it in position, that's a violation. All right. Another good little video here. favorite part of that video is he's not even finished his swing and he's saying bite. <laughs> I don't have that kind of feel anymore. I don't know about you guys. But, but so, so the caddy stood on his line. That's fine, but he removed before the stroke. So a good example of that there. Okay. Pointing on the line of play for a ball on the putting green. So before the stroke is made, only the player and his or her caddy may point out the player's line of play with some limitations. The player or the caddy may touch the putting green with a hand, foot, or anything he she is holding, but must not improve the conditions affecting the stroke in breach of Rule 8.1a. So you can't really, like, again, this, the example of this is tapping down like a trough to the hole, okay? We know we can repair damage now, okay? Certain things we can't repair, aeration holes, so on and so forth. So if you're touching the line, you're probably not going to be, uh, you know, improving the line of play in this situation. But if you do it, you're going to be in breach of Rule 8.1a. The player of the caddy must not set an object down anywhere. And I will pause there for a minute. Anywhere. On or off the putting green to show the line of play. This is not allowed even if that object is removed before the stroke is made. So the good example that we've seen before is the water bottle being placed on the fringe. Aim at the water bottle. I remove the water bottle. You are still penalized. Okay? You do not get out of penalty for this situation. Okay? While the stroke is being made, the caddy must not deliberately stand in a location on or close to the player's line of play, except during attendance at the flag stick, to help the player or do anything else to point out the line of play. We've had real good discussions about, you know, the caddy standing there and aim at my foot type of thing. Okay, so the caddy cannot be in position to, as an aiming device. All right, another good video here. Okay, it used to be a violation of the rules, no longer is. Okay. Does anybody think that should be a violation? It doesn't help out the player you know, beyond what they could reasonably expect, so no penalty in that situation. Oops. All right. Here's a, a 10.2B number three, no setting down an object to help taking a stance. And I made a mistake earlier this year, I was talking with Mark about you know, putting a club down. Uh, this is not allowed in, in the rules of golf anymore, so a player must not take a stance for the stroke using any object that was set down by or for the player to help in lining up his or her feet, body, such as a club, set down on the ground to show the line of play. Okay, so you used to be able to set a club down, but now you can't. Okay, so setting anything down and taking a stance and assisting yourself with alignment is a penalty, and you're not getting out of it. Okay, so once you do it, you're done. I shouldn't say you're done. You get two strokes. So, if the player takes a stance in the breach of the rule, he or she cannot avoid penalty by backing away from the stance and removing the object. So. Okay. Restriction on the caddy standing behind the player. This is one of the biggest new changes to the rules. Uh, when we do our club seminars throughout the Kansas City area, this is one of them that we point out. Um, we don't get all of the specific changes to all the clubs. That would take way too long, but we talk about, you know, 20 to 30 of the main ones. Um, but a player must not take a stance for the stroke using any object that was set down by or for the player to help aligning his or her feet, such as a club set down on the ground to show the line of play. So when that caddy is in position also as well, the player takes a stance in, this, in the breach of this rule, he or she cannot avoid penalty. So once you get in position and the caddy or your partner or you have somebody, it, it could be somebody you directed into that position, you are penalized, general penalty, and you cannot get out of it in that situation. I'll give an example of what they're talking about here. This is one of the, uh, one of the um, 
interpretations I'm referring to here, but like, again, this is very rare that we even really need to talk about the interpretations, but I just want you guys to see what they're talking about taking a stance, because many people have different pre-shot routines. You know, so what does taking a stance? And so, uh, aiming at the intended target is one of the challenges the player alone must overcome. This is something that you will see over and over again in this rule. We want the player to be able to do this on their own. So, if a player has their, his or her feet close to a position where useful guidance on aiming at the intended target could be given. So, you know, as you're stepping into it, we are considering taking your stance at that point, okay? So you could be getting information by that person standing back behind there. So that's what this rule really talks about. Um, examples of when a player has begun to take the stance include the player is facing the hole with the club behind the ball, the feet together, and then starts to turn his or her body. So if you're standing here with your, your club down like this, you're going to be in violation. Okay, just because you haven't actually started to get into position for your stroke, this is an example of lining up and somebody behind you could be helping you. Okay? After standing behind the ball to determine the target line, the player takes a step forward or turns his or her body to put a, 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 their foot in a place for the stroke. So if you're just standing right here behind the ball, you're fine. You make that motion there, now you're in the position where you could be penalized. Okay, they're pretty strict on this, this uh, stance thing. So just don't have anybody behind you. Gary. No one can do it. The caddy and the partner uh, can't, can't do that, or somebody you direct to do it. So you couldn't just you know, have a spectator. So it, it covers everything. So you can't put somebody in position. All right, everybody good on that one? Within this rule, if a player just kind of puts down a club without taking a stance, right. I think he's fine. But let me double check that. But 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 sounds like the words there would allow that. But uh, let me check that because uh, the purpose of the rule seems like we just don't want the player taking time laying clubs down and all this stuff. So let me look into that one. Okay. All right. So we do have an exception uh, of this uh, getting out of the penalty type of thing that we talked about. Is when your ball is on the putting green. So when the player's ball is on the putting green, there's no penalty under this rule if the player backs away from the stance and does not begin to take the stance until that person is out of position. So that will, may help you read putts. Some people like to kind of stand over their ball and have somebody help read a putt or something like that. That's fine, but you better get back out of that stance, have him move, and then get back in unless you want a penalty. Okay? So there's st you're still on the hook for a penalty if you don't get out of your stance on the putting green. And we're going to see this rule quite a bit, or the, I shouldn't say this rule, this uh, purple section there, I believe it's blue in the rules book, where it talks about the partners being involved in all these rules. One of the things I mentioned early in the, the seminars that we talked about is rules 1 through 20 don't use the word partner in the actual meat of the rules, but they include the partner. This is the example of that. So it talks about when the partner is involved or the caddy may be involved. So keep an eye on these sections in the rules book too. It's very important because it will include a lot of people on your side. So. All right, physical help and protection from the elements. Another impressive shot there. Does anybody want to be the umbrella guy? <laughs> so, I have fun with Google searches on some certain things, that's for sure. So, a player must not make a stroke while getting physical help from his or her caddy or any other person or with his or her caddy or any other person or object deliberately positioned to give protection from sunlight, rain, wind, or other elements. Okay, so we've got to play outside. It's an outdoor game. Let's deal with it. So. Interesting note, um, the rule does not prohibit the player from taking his or her own actions to protect it against the elements while making a stroke. So if you want to hold the umbrella over your head and make the stroke, <laughs> you're, you're not in violation. So I found that if I wanted to hold an umbrella, I'm probably not playing golf anyway, so I don't have to worry about that. So, okay. Before the stroke is made, we're allowed to do this. Okay. So your caddy can hold the umbrella while you're reading your putt or while you're even addressing you know, your, your stroke. That's fine provided the stroke is not made with that protection in place. Okay. Penalty for breach of 10.2 is the general penalty. Lost whole match play, two strokes in stroke play. All right, any questions before we move on to caddies? All right, 10.3. The player may have a caddy to carry the player's clubs and give advice and other help during the round, but there are some limits to what a caddy is allowed to do. The player is responsible for the caddy's actions during the round and will get a penalty if the caddy breaches the rules. So they're telling you to you know, background check your caddy. 
All right, so a player may have a caddy to carry, transport, or handle his or her clubs, give advice, and help him with any other ways allowed during a round, but with some limitations. The player must not have more than one caddy at any one time. I think we've got a uh, violation here during the par three contest, but I don't think many people are taking it too serious because they actually want to win the Masters, so you're not allowed to win them both. Okay. The player may change caddies during a round, but must not do so temporarily for the sole purpose of getting <coughs> advice from a new caddy. This is one of the examples of a decision being pumped into a new rule. There's a decision where you couldn't just get a new caddy because this caddy happened to know the, this green really well or anything like that. You can't just flip-flop caddies uh, just for a specific reason. Okay. So whether or not the player has a caddy, any other person who rides or walks along with the player who carries other things for the player, such as equipment, rain suit, umbrella, food, drink, all that stuff, is not the player's caddy, okay? Unless he or she is named by the player or carries clubs. So if I have somebody as a caddy, and then I have somebody also walking along carrying my rain suit and my lunch and things like that, I'm not using two caddies. By the, by the specific rule, okay, that is not a caddy. If that other person is carrying one of my clubs, then I do have two caddies, okay? Two or more players may share caddy, so when there is a rules issue involving the specific action of a shared caddy, it needs to be decided which player the action was responsible for. So if the caddy's action was taken by the specific direction by one of the players, the action uh, is gonna be based on that player's directing caddy, he is the caddy to that player in that situation. Okay. If there was no specific action, okay, the action is treated as the player sharing the caddy whose ball was involved. So if Bob and I are sharing a caddy and Bob, Bob's caddy moves his ball or something like that, it wasn't my caddy doing it, it was Bob's caddy doing it. Okay. Just because it specifically says right there, when there was no specific direction to the caddy whose ball was involved. Okay. Penalty for breach of this rule, the, penalty, the player gets a general penalty for each hole during where he or she is helped by more than one caddy at the time. And if the breach happens between the two holes, it goes to the general penalty for the next hole. So what's different about this new rule, or this rule, is there is no maximum. This can happen 18 times. You can get general penalty 18 times. It used to be that the maximum was the, the two holes or the two strokes twice for two holes. So. All right, so what can our caddy do so we don't get any penalties? Let's fight, figure that one out. Caddy may always take these actions when allowed under the rules, and that word always is important, so we don't have to worry about anything uh, as far as a specific direction to the caddy. Carry, transport, and handle the player's clubs and other equipment, including driving the cart or whatever. He may search for the player's ball. He can give information, advice, and other help before the stroke is made. Smooth bunkers or take other actions to care for the course. Remove sand and loose soil and repair damage on the putting green, so you don't have to tell your caddy to go do that. He can do that on his own. He can remove or attend the flag stick. And this is the new one that we've already discussed before, but he can mark the spot of the player's ball, lift and replace the ball on the putting green. He does not need authority from the player each and every time to do this. He used to, no longer does. And that's on the putting green only. Please keep in mind on that. And the player may clean, or the caddy may clean the player's ball as well. Removing loose impediments and movable obstructions anywhere. Because we know we can do this in a bunker. We know we can do it in a penalty area, teeing area, general area, putting green. But if the ball moves, the player is going to get penalized, except with the obstructions. So we'll get more specific about removing loose impediments and movable obstructions down the road, but hopefully everybody knows that little difference right now. Okay. Actions allowed only with the player's authorization. A caddy may take these actions only when the rules allow the player to take them, and only with the player's authorization. So it's a specific thing that you have to do each and every time. Okay, so. We, we can't have the caddy doing these different things without the authorization. It's very important. So like restoring conditions that were worsened after the player's ball came to rest. If the player is allowed to fix something, the caddy has to have authorization to do it. The caddy can't just go do it. Okay, so for example, you're in the bunker, somebody hits the bunker shot behind you and splashes your ball with sand. If you're allowed to recreate your lie, the caddy can only do that if you give him specific permission. He can't just go start and doing it. Okay. When the player's ball is anywhere except on the putting green, lift the player's ball under a rule. So a player, like I said, specifically it's on the putting green, so a, a caddy can't just go pick up a ball and say, well, we're going to take relief from this cart path. The player has to make that choice, and the player has to also tell the caddy if he wants that ball moved. So, and you can't just do the overall encompassing statement on the first tee and say, my caddy's going to lift my ball when it's ever on a cart path. No, this rule does not allow that. Each and every action has to be specifically directed. 
Uh, if I did this, that would be fine. Just doesn't have to be verbal, just any sort of action. Okay. Uh, caddy is not allowed to take these actions for the player. Okay. Concede a stroke, hole or match to the opponent, or agree with the opponent on the match score. Okay. So it's up to the players, the sides, to really make sure that they know what's going on in a match. The caddy is not involved in that. Okay. Deliberately stand on a close to the extension of the line of play. This is the rule that we were just talking about. You cannot deliberately stand there. The caddy or the partner, but the caddy specifically is covered in this rule 10.3. Okay. Replace the ball unless the caddy has lifted or moved it. Okay. We know we can do it on the putting green. Okay. But if we have a ball like it's, it's moved in play in the general area, the player or the partner's got to replace it unless the caddy was the one who initially moved the ball. And that's an example is if the player had given the caddy authorization to move the ball in the first place, now the caddy can replace it. Drop or place the ball in the relief area. So caddy's not allowed to do this. Your partner is, but your caddy is not. Decide to take relief under a rule. Again, like I mentioned earlier, the player is responsible for deciding how to play the, the, the game, what rules he's going to invoke, or how he's going to play the ball. The caddy is not allowed to do this for the player. Caddy may advise the player. I wouldn't do that, but the player must ultimately make the decision and drop the ball. Brute. Okay, so could a, a player or a player has a caddy point out the line of play on the putting green by touching the green with the flag stick in that video we talked about? Can he leave the, the flag stick there while the stroke is made? No, he cannot. He cannot do that. All right, so a player is responsible for his or her caddies both during a round and while play is stopped under 5.7, but not before or after a round. So there's a little different there. So while play is stopped, the caddy is still kind of under your wing there, so don't let him go do some crazy stuff there. Now, if the caddy's action breaches a rule or would breach a rule if the action was taken by the player, the player gets the penalty. So the, the caddy's actions are basically the same as the player's, is what this is telling us okay. when it comes to a violation of the rule. When application of a rule depends on whether the player is aware of certain facts, the player's knowledge is treating as including whatever is known by his or her caddy. Okay. A good example there is a, a caddy is like up on the fairway in the landing zone of like a, a, let's say a hole that goes up and over a hill and the ball goes up over the hill to the right, and it goes out of bounds, but somebody's in there mowing their lawn, and they kick it back into play, and the caddy sees it, but the player doesn't. Okay? This is treating as the player knows that information because the caddy now has that information. So the player must proceed under stroke and distance, and if he doesn't, he's probably going to get disqualified if he keeps on playing. So. All right, question for you, if you guys don't have anything for me. You made it through Rule 10. You think? All right. In stroke play event, Todd has a short putt on the putting green for a three. He makes a stroke and accidentally hits his ball twice and it goes in the hole, which the following is true. A, B, C, or D? A? Any penalties in this situation? Not anymore. And again, Todd question, probably no penalty. Yeah, rule 10.1a states if a ball is accidentally hit more than once, there has been one stroke and there is no penalty. And since there has been a stroke, we're going to play the balls that lies, which happened to go in the hole. Of course it did, because <laughs> it's Todd. So an accidental double hit on the putting green anywhere, again, one stroke is it, no penalty, play it as it lies. Accidental, that's the word. In a stroke play event, Bailey is on the putting green and is using a long putter. In making a stroke, she anchors the putter each time and takes three putts to complete the hole. Sorry, Bailey. What does Bailey get? No penalty strokes, is it allowed? Does anybody think that's okay? Good. All right. Does she get two penalty strokes for uh, anchoring her putter? That's partially right, but she gets it each and every time. Okay. Every stroke she makes with an anchored putter is going to cost her two strokes. The stroke counts plus the two penalty strokes. I think this is a good question I had for Mark a couple years ago. I don't remember that one. He played, he played an entire round with anchoring his putter. He ended up getting like, uh, I don't know, it was like 72 penalty strokes or something. I was having a lot of fun with him on that day. So, I'm sorry? Right. So different than like an intervening act is what we're talking about. So each stroke in itself is an intervening act in this case, if you want to look at it that way. It's, it's a way to look at it. But like if we took a bunch of practice swings in the bunker, we get a two-stroke penalty, provided we, you know, didn't know it was a penalty each time. 
So if the player knew it was a penalty each time, he's still going to get a two-stroke ding every time. But if the player takes a couple practice swings and they say, hey, you can't do that, and it's like, oh, sorry, two strokes, then if he does it again, he's getting another two. But he's only going to get two strokes for the amount that he does in that one. OK? All right, moving on to number 11. We're getting there. Yeah. Correct. Right, so a caddy can't concede a stroke, but if the player tells the caddy to concede the stroke for him like a distance away, that's fine. That would be okay. Yep. All right, rule 11, ball in motion accidentally hits a person, an animal, an object, or deliberate actions to affect the ball in motion. So now we're talking about that ball doing something and being directed a different way. Uh, outside influence is going to be something we talk about quite a bit. It used to be an outside agency. Um, we also got a couple new definitions. Animal, for example, so we'll talk about all those. So rule 11 covers what to do if the player's ball in motion hits a person, animal, equipment, or anything else on the golf course. When this happens accidentally, there is no penalty, and the player normally must accept the result, whether favorable or not, and play the ball from where it comes to rest. So accidental deflections. Okay, there's going to be no penalty. We're going to play it as it lies. Okay. Rule 11 also restricts a player from deliberately taking actions to affect where a ball in motion might come to rest. So if we have some intent of deflecting a ball, Rule 11 is going to cover it. All right, so notable changes. Again, no penalty for accidental deflections, and the ball is played as it lies. And stroke players still a penalty for putting and striking the ball at rest on the putting green. So if uh, Gary and I are playing in a stroke play event, and Gary's ball is up by the hole, and I hit my putt, we're both on the putting green, and I hit Gary's ball, I'm still getting a two-stroke penalty. Okay, so I'll have to ask Gary to mark that next time. Deliberate deflections under Rule 11.2 are outcome-based. There is no penalty if it's not deflected. Okay, so if you try to deflect a ball and you miss, you're lucky. <laughs> How about that? So even though there's intent there, it's an outcome-based rule. It must actually be deflected. Okay. Might influence the move of the ball standard is eliminated, just exactly what we just talked about. So might influence the movement of the ball was an old concept in the 2016 rules, no longer a concept in the new rules. All right, rule 11 covers what to do if a player's ball in motion hits any of these things. Basically, anything. The rule will cover what we're going to do. Play as it lies, replay it, so on and so forth. There's different things going on. Okay. When this happens accidentally, there's no penalty, and the player must normally accept the result. Okay. Whether it's favorable or not, we're going to play the ball from where it comes to rest. Again, rule 11 will talk about the deliberate actions as well under 11.2 and 11.3. Okay, this rule applies any time a ball in play is in motion, whether after a stroke or otherwise. So what's otherwise? Well, Todd's got a picture up here, so we hopefully know what that is. If we drop a ball, when is that ball in play? As soon as you release it, as soon as it leaves the hand. So if you drop it and you deliberately deflect it, Rule 11 is going to cover what we're going to do next. Okay, your ball is in play, falling through the air. Except when a ball has been dropped in a relief area, it's not going to come to rest, that situation is covered by 14.3. So we have a situation here that is beautiful to point out in the new rules, where you think you're in the right rule, but it's going to tell you where to go. Very kindly tell you where to go. <laughs> so it's going to direct you to the right rule. And, so, and, and that's when we have a, a dropping situation, the ball is in motion, so we're thinking, hey, rule 11, no, rule 14 is going to cover it. That's what I really like about this, is if you think you're in the right place and you're not, the rules will help you out. Okay, so most people are things that can affect what it's going to do to a player's ball is going to be considered an outside influence. Equipment is going to be now considered an outside influence. So your own equipment is now an outside influence as well. So animals, natural objects, artificial objects, another ball in motion are all parts of an outside influence. Okay, so most everything in the world is an outside influence. Very, very large amount of things. Any living member of the animal kingdom other than humans is going to fall underneath the definition of animal, okay? including mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, invertebrates, worms, insects, spiders, crustaceans. Keep on going. We can keep on going. So also, if you'll notice, loose impediments can also be involved in a couple, like insects and things like that. They can fall underneath the two different things here. Just because something is an animal doesn't mean it's not a loose impediment necessarily. The loose impediment definition will cover that as well. So if a player's ball in motion 
accidentally hits any person or outside influence, there's no penalty to any player. So this player just had a wicked lip out and hit an outside influence. So there's no penalty in that situation. And this is true if it hits, hits the player, the opponent, the other player, or any other caddies or their equipment. Okay? And so equipment can also be a lot of things. Okay? Bananas are equipment, as long as you're carrying them. Okay? So anything that you're carrying is going to be considered inside this rule of equipment and an outside influence. Okay? Okay? Ball played on the putting green and stroke play. If a player's ball in motion hits another ball at rest on the putting green and both balls were on the putting green before the stroke, the player gets the general penalty. So if this player here hits her putt and hits that ball that was at rest, Great shot, but she's adding two strokes to it. Or in match play, she loses the hole. Okay, so the question is, we've got a, long, a player making a long putt and a ball at rest in the putting green near the hole. The player makes the long putt. Can the owner of that golf ball mark his ball and lift it? And the new answer is yes. The old answer was no. And we will specifically get into this even a little bit deeper here, a little bit today. But you can mark that ball. Okay, if you lift it, there's no penalty under this rule, but it better be marked. Okay, so you can't just get the ball out of the way. But... Same situation. It's, it's, it's the same situation. We'll, and we'll cover it here a little bit deeper. Yep. So getting back to our double hit guy again, uh -huh. if he swings and misses with his second try to hit the ball, is it two strokes? So for just to back up a little bit here, the double hit guy, if a guy sw swings and the ball pops up there and he takes a swing at it again and swings and misses it, has he played a moving ball? Yes. He's made a stroke with intent, he's playing a moving ball. So he's still going to get four strokes even if he, even if he whiffs in that situation. Yeah. The, the, player gets the, gen, the player gets a general penalty in, in stroke play. Match play, I'm glad you brought this up because I may have misstepped earlier. Match play, there's no penalty for hitting a ball in the putting green. Yeah, so stroke play, is you're going to get the two-stroke penalty, but if you hit your opponent's ball in match play in the putting green, there's no penalty. We play it as it lies. And that other ball is going to be replaced. Match play is a different animal. It's just a totally, diff totally different rule. So, yep, exactly. All right. So if a player's ball in motion accidentally hits any person or outside influence, the ball must be played as it lies, except in two situations. When a ball is played from anywhere except the putting green comes to rest on any person, animal, or moving outside influence. So if your ball comes to rest on one of these animate things in this situation, you can't play the ball as it lies. That's what they're saying. Okay. Exception two, when the ball is played from the putting green, accidentally hits any person, animal, or movable obstruction, including another ball motion on the putting green, what are we going to do? We're going to replay it. We're going to replay that stroke. Okay, so we're not going to play the ball as it lies in that situation. We're going to replay it. So, talking about exception one, when the ball is anywhere except the putting green, the player must drop the original ball or another ball in this relief area. If everybody remembers an example of Rory's ball coming to rest in a spectator's pocket, the rule says you must not play the ball as it lies. Spectator, very big smile. So, he doesn't even, Rory didn't have the option of playing this ball because it would come to rest on a person. Okay. So, the reference point is that estimated point right under where the ball first came to rest on the person, animal, or moving outside influence. Um, I use the example here, if a ball comes to rest in a golf cart, okay, and it's moving, we're not going to wait for that cart to stop to get our reference point. When that ball comes to rest into the cart, we're going to use the reference point there at that point. Okay, so we're not going to let the cart drive off to the clubhouse or to the next hole. It's where that ball comes to rest. Okay, the size of the relief area is going to be one club length from that reference point and must be in the same area of the golf course as the reference point and must not be near the hole. So we're really going to start getting to some good examples and some good definitions of within the rules of what our reference, or excuse me, our relief area is going to be. So we're going to see this statement quite a bit moving forward now. Talking about where we drop the ball when we need to. Okay, Carol. Um, there's a situation where it's like, let's say the same area as the 
If the ball, if these guys stand in there and then mm -hmm. throw the best play to give away a couple, and the guy stay in the bunker. Right. He cannot drop. Yes, he can, because his reference point will be in the bunker. Where his ball comes to rest, the reference point is going to be defined at the spot below the ground where the ball comes to rest. So if the guy was standing in the bunker and the ball comes into his pocket, no, no, no. He's standing in the general area. okay. So if he's standing in the general area, his reference point is the general area. Right. Must drop in the general area. That's what this. Yes. I'm not sure, and I, don't, I really don't care, <laughs> to be honest, because it, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> but I, I, I think he probably was able to do it before, but I don't think, I, I'm not sure on that one. But this rule specifically says we get the reference point, and you have to drop in that same area of the golf course. So that big pie that we come up with might be cut off by a penalty area or so on and so forth. I would think so. So if, if, if the reference point gives us a spot on the golf course, let's say the general area, and there's no relief area associated with that reference point because of a penalty area or something like that, my guess is, is we're going to find the nearest point that we can do that. But I'm not 100% sure on that because, for example, the embedded ball rule doesn't have that luxury. Like if your embedded ball comes into a spot where there is no reference point, you just don't get relief. So I'm not 100% sure on that one. That's a good question. I'll, I'll look into that one. All right, so when a ball is on the putting green, the player must place the original ball or another ball so we can substitute in this uh, situation where the ball on the putting green has to be, the stroke has to be canceled and replayed. On the estimated spot, right under where the ball first came to rest on the person, animal, or moving outside influence. So this is the same rule before. If we're taking relief for this on a putting green, we place it. Anywhere else, we're going to drop it. Okay. Using the procedures for replacing the ball in rules 14, which we'll talk about in a couple weeks. Okay, so... All right, so when the ball played from a putting green accidentally hits any person, animal, or movable obstruction on the putting green. Okay, we've got another wicked lift out going on here. The stroke does not count, and the original ball or another ball must be replaced on its original spot. Okay, so you make a stroke from the putting green, and it basically hits anything that's moving or an object that is not moving, an obstruction or an outside influence, we are going to re cancel and replay. Like if a loose impediment comes across and, and hits your ball, this is the same as the rule used to be, we're going to cancel and replay it. But if you hit a person, we're going to cancel and replay it. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. I believe it has to deflect the ball with a loose impediment. I believe it has to deflect it. So it's a question of fact whether or not the ball is deflected by the loose impediment. Because I know you can't move that loose impediment with the ball in motion. So we'd have to, I'd have to look into that one as well. I remember that one. Yeah, and I think he still played it as it lies, if I don't remember. Yeah, so that, yeah. Yeah, if it, if it strikes a loose impediment that's moving, I think it's a difference. Because if, it, if it's just a loose impediment on the green and you putt over it, you just play it as it lies. But if it blows into position, I think it's probably going to be played as it lies. But if it's moving or deflects the ball, I, I, we'd have to look into it specifically. Um, kind of the old tumbleweed decision as well. Yeah, let's, let's look into that one before I give you a definitive answer on that one. An old tumbleweed. There used to be a, a decision that a tumbleweed moved a ball in, in motion. So. so a lot of times, like in the fall, you have to use the mm -hmm. greens or pine needles or whatever that are on a green. Somebody's got a long putt. Right. It would be excessive to clean the line. If somebody putts and sees the ball get deflected. Right. Ball, yeah, we, that's, that's why I want to look in this. It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like we would re cancel and replay that stroke. So, so that's, that's why I'm not 100% sure if the loose impediment is moving, or if the ball is deflected by a moving loose impediment. I'm, I'm, so I'm saying it's not even moving. 
Yeah, it, but if it's not moving, I know that. If, if, you put, if your ball goes over a loose impediment on the putting green, you played as it lies. But it's whether or not the ball was deflected by a moving loose impediment. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that one because it comes up a lot. You know, <laughs> it's one of those situations. So, All right. Ball motion strikes another ball or ball marker rests in the putting green. The stroke counts and the ball must be played. Okay, so we see rule 11.1, whether a penalty applies into stroke play. So this is kind of what we were just talking about that Jackie brought up here. So in stroke play, uh, we're going to see if there is a penalty involved. So if the ball was at rest, if the player makes a stroke and another ball is at rest, you hit it in stroke play, we're going to get a penalty. The ball that you played is going to be played as it lies. The ball that is deflected is going to be replaced. That's what this rule is saying here. So match play, we're just going to play it as it lies and replace the ball that was moved. No penalty. Ball motion accidentally hits flag stick or person attending flag stick. This is under 13.2b. We will get really into this one in a couple of weeks talking about that. It's not covered by this rule. We know that we can hit the flag stick, but we also know that it has to be an accident if we strike an attendant, which is a very rare situation. So we'll talk about that specifically as, uh, when we're moving forward in a couple of weeks. Or if anyone wants to ask me afterwards. But I want to talk more about rule 11 today. So the penalty for playing an incorrectly substituted ball or playing from a wrong place is you're going to get the general penalty. So if you don't replace your ball or you play a ball when you're supposed to cancel it, you're penalized under 6.3 or 14.7, not underneath this rule. Not that the player's going to be excited to know what rule they're penalized under. They're still going to get penalized. And then our 1.3C4 rule, if we have multiple breaches, that will cover whether or not it's two or four strokes or so on and so forth. All right, any questions on that other than what we talked about? You guys give me some good ones to look up. I appreciate that. I don't know. Give me my afternoon. I'll look up some things to talk about there. So, All right, so let's talk about if a ball motion is deliberately deflected. Okay, 11.2 is going to cover this situation. When, when does that rule apply? We're going to talk about, and we're going to apply it to a player in 11.2b, and we're going to, uh, where we're going to play the ball is going to be 11.2c. Okay, significant changes. Again, penalties are intent and outcome-based. So we have to have intent to deflect it, and we have to deflect it. Okay, so again, if you failed on your deflection, you're lucky. So if a deliberate deflection occurs, it always requires an estimation of where it comes to rest. So if a ball in motion is deliberately deflected by somebody, we're going to estimate where that ball would have come to rest and deal with it there. Okay. And this rule applies only when it's known or virtually certain that a player's ball in motion was deliberately deflected. We may have seen this video before. Hey, that ball's in bounds now. <laughs> so in that situation, that cart path or that concrete or whatever was out of bounds. That was the out of bounds line right there. And this uh, spectator def deliberately deflected the ball back in play. Is it the guy's lucky day? Nope. Nope. He's gonna, we're going to estimate where that ball would have come to rest, which it probably would have come to rest out of bounds. And he's going to deal with stroking distance in that situation. Nice, kind-hearted soul, but unfortunately didn't help. Well, it, there's some facts that we would consider. I mean, we would, but ultimately, you know, we'd ha we'd, we'd, I wouldn't say that there's a black and white answer to that question. Like, like, it, like if, there is, if there's a slope there and, it, and we know the ball was going to come back in bounds, then that's what we're going to estimate it to be. I mean, it's, it's like the virtual certainty question. If we know where that, if we can determine with cert virtual certainty where that ball is going to come to rest, that's how we're going to apply the rule. But in that situation, I think the player is not going to get the benefit of the doubt. So, you think she knew the rule? I doubt she knew the rule. <laughs> I doubt she knew the rule. So, okay. So if if a player, uh, we have a partner here, he's actually he's putting the flag stick down to deflect the ball. Here's what this picture is showing. Um, so the player is going to get a penalty in this situation because the partner is putting the, the flag stick down to stop his putt from going too far. So this is this is covered by 11.2. His opponent's going to deal with the consequences in that situation. The player will not be penalized. Okay. And this rule only applies when it is known or virtually certain that a player's ball in motion was deliberately deflected or stopped by a person. So this is where it specifically says we have to have a deflection. Virtually known or certain that it's deflected. Okay. So if you guys are wondering where that is in the rule, there it is. It's not, if you miss, you're okay. Right. 
Yeah, and the loose impediment rule is different than this rule. Yeah, and the loose impediment rule is different, but you're right. Yeah, if you move a loose impediment deliberately and it doesn't affect the ball, you're still going to be penalized if it would have affected the ball. Yeah, different rule, but you're right. All right, so what, what does it mean to be uh, deliberately deflected? It's when a person deliberately touches the ball in motion or the ball in motion hits any equipment or other object uh, except a ball marker or another ball at rest. Those are covered by a different rule. Or any person that the player deliberately positioned or left in a particular location. So again, this is talking about deliberate actions. So different rules will cover if a ball hits a ball marker or if it hits a person that's an accident. This rule specifically says if we're talking about positioning something deliberately. So that the equipment or the object of the person might deflect or stop the ball in motion. Okay. But again, if you put it in position, it's got to deflect it for this rule to, to apply. Okay, the exception is the ball deliberately deflected or stopped in match play when no reasonably chance it can be hold. Okay, that ball's flying by that hole there. You can go ahead and pick it up. Okay, well, the, the opponent's not going to get a penalty in that situation. Okay. The opponent's ball in motion that is deliberately or deflected or stopped at a time when there's no reasonable chance that it can be hold, and this is done as a concession or when the ball needed to be hold to tie the hole. Everybody know what the person is going to be referred to as this rule forever? Jordan Spieth. Yeah. Yeah, in, the, in the Ryder Cup, when he picked up the ball that was in motion past the hole, the old rules still gave him a penalty because he deflected a ball in motion. Even though it wasn't going to go in the hole, the new rules have address, addressed this. So just, it makes sense. The, it's not going to affect the outcome of the hole. Go ahead and stop it. Okay. And it's also covered by Rule 3, which talks about the competition. So. All right. So when does 11.2 apply for a player's right to have a ball or ball marker lifted before a stroke is made, or if he or she reasonably believes the ball or ball marker might help or interfere with play, we're going to see Rule 15. So we've got a different situation where we might have interference. Rule 15 is going to cover that. So you can start to see where these rules are really directing us in the right direction to, to where we're going to make our rulings. Very, very common in this rule. So a player gets the general penalty if he or she deliberately deflects or stops any ball in motion. And this is true whether it's the player's own ball, a ball played by an opponent, or a ball played by another player in stroke play. Okay, so any ball in motion, and you deliberately deflect it, you're going to get a penalty. Okay, the exception is the ball moving in water. Okay, there's no penalty if a player lifts his or her ball moving in water, whether it's temporary or in a penalty area. So you can go ahead and just lift it on out of there. And there's that statement talking about your partners involved in this rule too as well. Not just you. So what do we do if we have a ball purposely deflected? Well, we're going to estimate where it comes to rest, and we're going to deal with it there. So if it is known or virtually certain that a player's ball in motion was deliberately deflected by a person, it must not be played as it lies. Okay? So we, we're not going to play the ball as it lies under any situation. Okay? Instead, the player must take relief in a certain way. So if the stroke was made from anywhere except the putting green, any of the four areas, the teeing area, general area, penalty area, or bunker, the player must take relief based on the estimated spot of where the ball would have come to rest if not deflected or stopped. Okay, so everybody get that? It's intentionally deflected anywhere except the putting green. We're going to estimate where it comes to rest and deal with it from there. So, back to John Daly's video. Okay. Uh huh. He should, he can still be played to finish the hole, press it back down to the bottom of the hill and play it again. Not correct. No. So, so the John Daly example. He did not deliberately deflect the ball. He played a stroke. He had intent to hit the golf ball. He played a moving golf ball. He's underneath a different rule. Yeah, so he's got to play the ball as it lies in that situation. So had he stopped the ball instead of make a stroke, now this rule would have applied. The example, I think, Ray, asked, you asked a question? Um, yeah, you asked the question about Phil Mickelson. So like instead of Mickelson making the stroke. So, so I think they said Ray. Sorry, Lynn. If you stop the ball, this rule covers it. So Mickelson would have to estimate where that ball would have come to rest in that situation had he stopped it. So where would Daly move to play the next shot? We're going to estimate it. If, if he stops it on that hill, we're going to estimate it. We're, we're just going to say, okay, that thing's rolling down the hill. It comes to rest here. But he hit it, so he's not, he's not underneath this rule. I know, but where, in that situation, where would he go? Where his ball comes to rest. So he had goal there. Yep, yep. When, when he played that moving ball, He's got to deal with where it comes to rest. Okay. Had it gone in the hole, he gets it in the hole. So, yep. So if you have a mistake stroke play competition, you have a fellow competitor standing over the green by the putt boundary, maybe, 
Yes. Correct. Done. Yeah. So the question was, we got, we got a player playing out of the bunker, and another player in stroke play is behind the green, and the bunker shot gets bladed, and the guy stops it from going out of bounds, deliberately deflects it. This rule kicks in. This guy who deliberately deflects it gets a two-stroke penalty, and the guy that hit the bunker shot has to proceed under stroke and distance because the ball would have gone out of bounds. Okay. In a match play, we just get a loss of hole, we move on. We don't have to replay anything. So. In match play, if he's conceding the hole, that, that's when the Jordan Spieth thing would, would come into play. Right. Gotcha. So he's grabbing his ball. So, like, so a player standing out of bounds, and the ball has come out of bounds, and the player stops it as a courtesy to get it back to him. I don't think this rule would apply. I don't think this rule would apply. Correct. So if a spectator stopped the ball in the bunker situation, it's still, it's still a, 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 a person deliberately deflecting it. The spectator gets two strokes. <laughs> All right. um, so the, obviously we don't deal with the spectator, but we do estimate that the ball comes to rest. Out of bounds. Yep. Yep. Up. On the flagship situation where the ball is stopped, mm -hmm. So if we don't have an agreement on where an estimated spot is, okay, if we can't get the committee involved, we're going to let the player make the best decision based on his judgment under Rule 1. We're going to say the player is going to make his best possible estimation, and if, he, if it turns out that he's making his estimation as best as he can, he's fine, no matter where he puts it. But if he does it, doesn't do it right, says, oh, I think it's up over here, and we find out later, then we can penalize him. So if we don't get an agreement, again, the rules are going to back on the player. Right. That, that would be, an, so if a player is attending the flag stick for another player and they can't get the flag out, a different rule is going to cover that, the flag stick rule. It's going to be an accident because he couldn't, he was trying to get it out. So there wouldn't be a, a penalty in that situation. And we will deal with that uh, when we come back in a couple weeks. So, yeah, but it doesn't, it's not covered in this rule. So, all right, so stroke made from anywhere except the putting green. So when the ball would have come to rest anywhere on the golf course except the putting green, the player must drop the original ball or another ball in the relief area. So this is the example where we've played a ball from anywhere in the golf course, somebody has deliberately deflected it, and it's going to come to rest anywhere but the putting green. What we're going to do is we're going to have a reference point based on where that estimated spot is, and we're going to have a one club length relief area based on that reference point, and it must be the same area of the golf course as the reference point. So, for example, the ball is deliberately deflected from a stroke played from the teeing area. It looks like it would have gone into the bunker, we're going to estimate the spot where it is in the bunker, and the player is going to drop within one club length of that spot in the bunker. Pretty simple, right? All right. So when the ball would have come to rest on the putting green, what are we going to do? The player must place the original ball or another ball on the estimated spot where the ball would have come to rest. So pretty simple. So if that shot from the teeing area was going to end up on the putting green, somebody deflects it deliberately, we're going to estimate where it comes to rest. You're going to place a ball or a ball marker on the putting green. Again. Place in the putting green, drop everywhere else. Okay. When the ball would have come rest to out of bounds, like we talked about, the player must take stroke and distance relief. So you've got to go back to where you last played from if the ball was going to go out of bounds. Okay, so now if we have a stroke that is made from the putting green, okay, so we're really uh, dividing this up quite a bit. So the stroke does not count on the original ball or another ball must be replaced on its original spot. So any time if the ball played from a putting green is deliberately deflected, 
we are going to cancel and replay. We're going to cancel and replay. Yeah, unfortunately. Yep. Yep. It's the same thing if the ball gets deflected out of bounds. So it doesn't matter. The result of the shot will not matter. Yes. Yeah, he's the, the person who does the. <laughs> yep. You're going to lose the hole. Yep, exactly. Yep. So the, the, whoever deflects the ball still gets the penalty. We're just going to cancel and replay it. Okay. And notice I highlighted here, here's a unique situation in which we can replace a, a ball, but it may be substituted. Okay. So this rule specifically says it. Because remember what I talked about, if you're going to drop a ball, you can always substitute it. If you replace a ball, you can't substitute it. Here's an example of when you can, and it says specifically in the rules. Okay. And why is that? Okay. Could have damaged the ball, could have kicked it into a lake. You know, there's all kinds of things that could have happened. So this rule will allow substitution upon replacement. Just wanted to point that out. Here you go. All right, so penalty for uh, if you put it back in the wrong place, you're going to get the uh, wrong place penalty underneath a different rule. And again, uh, the general penalty applies underneath that rule, not the specific rule of 11. So, all right. Any other questions on that? Yes. Yes. But if you take the foot and you kick it, then you have to determine where it would come to rest. Correct. Yeah. So the rule isn't you have to deflect the ball, you better deflect it with the target next to it. You better make a stroke. Yeah. And and that's ultimately where the decision to Mickelson came down to. So so the question again was what's the difference between Mickelson and Daly playing a stroke versus stopping it with your foot? And so again, if you intentionally play a ball that is moving you're going to get a two-stroke penalty and play as it lies. And if you intentionally stop the ball, you're going to get a two-stroke penalty and we're going to estimate where it goes. Okay, so even if you use a club to stop the ball intentionally, you're not making a stroke. So this rule applies. Okay, so we have to figure out the fact. Was a stroke being played or was a stroke not being played to separate these two rules? Uh, that's, that's how that would be decided. And, and that's where I was in the camp of Mickelson should have been disqualified. But I might be in the camp of disqualified in this one too as well. So, so you don't want me on the committee. You don't want me on the committee on that one. Because I, I mean, that's, I mean we, can, we can talk about that a, a lot. About whether or not that's just playing a stroke or not the spirit of the game. And so, Brooke? Yes. Yeah, so, so when you're required to play by stroke and distance under this rule, which is deliberately deflecting a ball that would have gone out of bounds, you can proceed underneath any of the out-of-bounds options that are applicable for the time. So whether the local rule is in effect, then you can go to the fairway or, or do whatever you want to do. Yeah, so you just have to proceed underneath out-of-bounds, whatever is uh, in place. Okay. Mark? Yes. Now you, you got to replay it, yeah, because it's a, it's it's a move, it's a it's an obstruction. Well, it's 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 a movable obstruction. Yeah. So the the question was, there was a decision that used to be like if you pulled the flag out, the cup liner came out, and they actually split this decision into whether or not the cup liner was moving or if it was stationary. Um, the new rule says if you if it strikes an obstruction, you're going to cancel and replay it. So it doesn't matter if it's moving or not in that situation. But that is a, a bit of a change. Yep. All right, so significant changes in 11.3. It replaces part of the 1.2, which is the ball in motion and the intent that we talked about. Okay, so the old rule 1-2 is kind of incorporated into this one. Previous might influence rules are now intention based, so we need to know what the player was thinking or what the person was thinking when something happened here. Allowed to lift a ball in the putting green even if it is going to influence a ball in motion coming to rest. This is what we talked about a little bit earlier. I told you we'd get to it eventually. 
Okay? So when a ball is in motion, a player must not deliberately take any of these actions to affect where that ball or the player's own ball or another player's ball might come to rest. This is the example of uh, Camille Vigegas, who is moving a loose impediment um, that he created actually as well to affect, affect where his ball in motion is going to come to rest and he gets a penalty in this situation. Okay? You cannot alter the physical conditions by taking any of the actions listed in 8.1 like we talked about, like smoothing out the ground or replacing a divot or even taking a divot out to affect your ball in motion. This is we need to know what your intent was when you were doing this. He didn't know that the ball was coming back. So he's just right. So now we go to his intent. Right. Did he have intent to deflect his ball or to affect his ball motion? No. So he wouldn't be penalized. And this rule specifically talks about we have to have intent in this situation. So good point there. Okay. We cannot lift or remove a loose impediment. And Rule 15 covers this one. I mentioned that with Mark's question earlier. Actually covers covers that. Or a movable obstruction, like a rake or anything. Everybody remember the Corey Pavin incident at Southern Hills uh, where the caddy lifted up his rake so his ball would roll into the hazard. I mean, and that's not why he lifted it, but that's what he did. And he, when he lifted that rake, he actually got a penalty on Corey, plus his ball ended up in the hazard. And it was a hazard at the time. It's not, now it's a penalty area. Okay, so the exception is moving the flag stick or the ball at rest on the putting green and other player equipment. This rule does not prohibit a player from lifting or moving a removed flag stick so if your flag stick is going to be struck by a ball in motion, you can pick it up, no penalty. This rule allows that. A ball at rest in the putting green, that's the new change that we talked about earlier. So if a ball is going to be struck by a ball in motion and that ball at rest can be lifted, no penalty for lifting it, but there's a penalty if you don't mark it. Because remember, we need that spot of the ball marked. So you've got to be quick. You've got to get into your pocket, you've got to get down there, you've got to get it going. Oh. Any other player's equipment. So if, I, if I, Bob makes a stroke, and it's going to hit his equipment, I can move his equipment if I want to. No penalty. No penalty there. It wouldn't be a penalty if it hit his equipment either. Yep. Yes. Yes. The ball, the ball in the putting green is always going to have to be marked in that situation if it's going to be hit by another ball in motion. Yep. There will be some penalties that we'll talk about in Rule 14 for not marking your ball correctly. Okay, a ball at rest anywhere except on the putting green. Okay, so you can't move a ball that's in the, in the fairway. This is not allowing this to happen. You can't just move a ball in the fairway. Okay, the putting green is the exception. So fairway, bunker, anywhere else on the golf course, you can't move a ball to, if another ball is going to hit it. Okay. Yes, the caddy can mark the ball in the putting green. That's, that's fine. Not a problem. Caddy has that authorization now. Yep. With the authorization. Of another, another player can do it with the authorization. So, but this rule will allow him to also move it out of the way, but he does have to mark it. Okay, so, so this rule actually, even without the authorization, I think he's okay to do it here. Let me, let me look into that one and be sure I'm, I'm clear on that one. I think this rule will allow a player to mark any ball in the putting green and lift it. I think that's the case. Okay, but if uh, you breach this rule, you're going to get the general penalty. So if you don't do anything right underneath 11.3, you're going to lose the whole match play. Two strokes and strokes play. All right, again, talking about your partner having the same responsibilities as you underneath this rule. Okay, any other questions on 11? This is, uh, there's been a lot of good questions brought out that I've got to do some research into. This is a very interesting rule, so. More of a side note then, the manual of that caddy report that you've given. The uh, official's guide? The official's guide. The, the KCGA official's guide, yep. I don't know if we're going to get that deep into certain things because if, really if, if, we, if I create a book like that, it's going to be as thick as the rules book. I mean, you've got a rules book that allows it, so. It has some graphs in there. Yeah. I mean, there's some things that we will ret retain, but I, I just can't put everything into a little manual like that. But I, I may or may not. I haven't really dealt with it yet, so. But, all right. Let's get into some questions for you. So in a stroke play event, Todd makes a stroke from the putting green, and Doug, another player, plays a bunker shot which strikes Todd's ball in motion, which of the following is true. What are we going to do in this situation? Okay, so Todd's putting, Doug's in the bunker. So what do we know about a ball played from the putting green that's deflected by an outside influence? Cancel and replay. 
What do we know about a ball in motion played from anywhere else that is deflected by a ball in motion? Played as it lies. Yeah. Doug's ball we played as it lies. Todd's stroke is canceled and replayed. No penalty to anybody. Okay. So if a ball is played from a putting green and hits an outside influence, in this case Doug's ball, the stroke is canceled and replayed. In Doug's case, his ball is played from a bunker and is also hit by an outside influence, but is played as it lies. Okay. Just understand the difference from where the ball was played. That's very important, where the ball was at rest when the stroke was made. All right, ready for the quiz review? Question number one, true or false? I like to start off these things. Player lays his bag on the putting green to shield his line from wind and makes a stroke. There's no penalty, true or false? Well, I hope everybody thinks that's a penalty. That just looks bad in all types of ways. Yeah. Protection from the elements with an object during a stroke is a penalty. So if he puts it down to protect it from the wind and then moves it before the stroke, is he penalized? No. No, this penalty applies during a stroke. By rule, a person who walks along carrying a player's umbrella and rain suit is a caddy. True or false? False. Yes. By rule, a player, person carrying that equipment is not a caddy. Okay. If he carries clubs or is designated as a caddy, then he is a caddy. Okay. By rule, teammates in different groups on a high school team may give advice to each other during the round. False. Yeah, teammates are not partners, thus advice is not allowed. However, Team competitions 24.4C, we will talk about when we can allow that. All right, there's another answer for you. We jumped out real quick for some reason. A caddy purposely touches the putting green and showing his player the line of play. The player incurs a general penalty. True or false? False, he does not. The touching the green is now expressly permitted in the rule. What's the next answer? <laughs> Very good, I didn't even give the question and you knew the answer. There is a misstep bogey for PowerPoint for me. All right, so a player who has taken a stance avoids penalty for his partner standing on an extension of his line of play in the general area. If he backs out of the stance and retakes his stance, we know that that is a penalty. And you cannot get out of that penalty. You can get out of the penalty only on the putting green. All right. In match play, Bailey is in with a four. Jackie has a putt for a four, which is a have, which is now called tied, which they, don't, they really don't say have anymore. Bailey says that putt you have is uphill, better hit it hard. What's the ruling? Yep, Bailey loses the hole under 10.2a. The old rule considered that a half, considered it a half hole, but that rule no longer exists. If you, if, even if Bailey's in the hole with a four and she creates a loss of hole penalty for herself, she's done, she loses the hole. Okay? The old rule would have given her a half, but the new rules say it's just a loss of hole. See, your match play rules are getting more complicated now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, in match play, Doug hits a putt that is heading toward uh, Taylor's, his opponent's ball on the putting green. While the ball is rolling, Taylor marks and lifts her ball, and Doug's ball rolls over the ball mark. What is the correct ruling? Is this allowed? Yes. There is no penalty underneath that exception of 11.3. A ball at rest in the green may now be lifted while another ball is in motion. Flag stick or equipment fall underneath that too. But, but again, please make sure that ball is marked when it is lifted. Okay. In singles match play, Todd's tee shot deflects off Bailey's bag that was in the rough and goes out of bounds. The correct ruling is there's no penalty. Todd must proceed under stroke and distance. Okay, so what did my ball hit? In the rules of golf, what did my ball hit? An outside influence. Yeah, somebody else's equipment is an outside influence. That is true. You got me on that one. There is no penalty for hitting, my, hitting the bag. I should have stated that. You, one for Gary. <laughs> I'd love you guys looking for those little things on me. It makes, makes me stay on my toes. All right, so again, moving forward, the option of replaying a stroke when striking an opponent's equipment has been removed. Okay, you used to, the player used to have the option, if you struck the opponent or the opponent's equipment, of replaying the stroke. That is no longer the case. We play the ball as it lies without penalty. Okay, in stroke plays, Jackie's ball accidentally strikes her caddy who is standing out of bounds, and the ball comes to rest in the general area. What's the correct ruling? No penalty, and the ball is played as it lies because this was an accident. Okay? Had, she, had her caddy intentionally deflected the ball back into bounds, we got a different ruling, right? Okay, so. And the old decision of 19-23 has been kind of flipped on its head a little bit here. Okay, what, what used to be the penalty there? Hitting your own caddy or hitting your own equipment was a penalty. It's no longer a penalty. All right, question number six. Which of the following possibly results in a penalty? An opponent stops a ball in motion that is clearly not a chance of being hold for the tie. We talked about this, this is the Jordan Spieth exception. 
So once a stroke for a tie can no longer be reasonably hold, the ball in motion may be stopped by an opponent. Okay. It's kind of a sticky situation back in the Ryder Cup. So B, a player makes a stroke at a ball that has come to rest on a sleeping animal. Yeah, yeah, it could be, if it's a possum, I guess we'd have to check the intent of the possum. <laughs> so, but no, the specific rule is you, might, you cannot play a ball at rest on a person or an animal or an, a moving uh, outside influence. So, playing a stroke on a sleeping animal is a penalty. So, a flag stick that is removed is deliberately moved by a caddy as the player's ball is rolling to it. We know that this is not a penalty. Uh, a removed flag stick can be moved at any time without penalty in that situation. All right, so a ball deliberately def stopped by a spectator from going into a bunker is placed on the spot in the bunker where it was estimated it would have come to rest and played. Okay, this is a penalty because a ball that is deliberately stopped will come to rest in a bunker in a penalty area needs to be dropped in the relief area. Okay, so there's a difference there. So make sure that if, if the ball that is deliberately deflected is going to be put anywhere that is not on the putting green, we have to drop it into the, re to the relief area. So that's where that penalty would occur. Everybody get that one? That's a bit of a tricky one. Okay, a partner tends to stop the player's ball from going into a punker, but misses and does not touch it. I mentioned it a couple times earlier, no penalty. This rule is outcome-based rule, not just intent. I said not intent, but not just intent. We have to have intent to be deliberate, yes, but it's not a penalty unless you actually deflect the ball in motion. All right, so we will see you in two weeks from today. We'll talk about flag sticks, bunkers, putting greens, and a lot of different things. Thanks, everybody.